These days I'm usually working a week ahead, so normally you won't see responses to a video's comments until two weeks after that video launches. That's the case this week, where I'm responding to comments about the video that launched a fortnight ago. That video was entitled EVs, 10 things you won't miss about your ice car. It's fair to say there was a bit of kickback to that video. I received a fair bit of criticism for what I had to say on many fronts. One of the areas that got people most worked up was that I suggested that manual gearboxes were less than ideal. Get an automatic, the commenters shouted. So let's discuss why I wouldn't do that today. Apologies if we get any problems with the sound today. It's quite windy up here today, so hopefully it won't cause a lot of trouble. Now the gearbox in an internal combustion engine car exists because of the limitations of an internal combustion engine. Unlike an electric motor, which has lots of torque at zero speed, an ice cannot produce torque below a certain minimum speed. It needs to be turning at at least 800 to 1000 revolutions per minute in order to sustain combustion and more like 1500 RPM or maybe a little bit less to generate enough power to move the car. Because of this we need some way to disconnect the engine from the wheels when the car is stationary. Furthermore, an internal combustion engine has a maximum speed at which it can operate, typically about 5,500 to 7,000 RPM, maybe up to about 8 or a little bit more in a very special engine. Now those two figures, 1,500 to about 7,000, gives a total variation in the speed of the engine of about 4 to 5 times minimum to maximum. If the car can do a minimum of 5 miles an hour with the engine directly linked to the wheels, then without a gearbox the top speed is at most 20 to 25 miles an hour. Fundamentally that's why we need a gearbox. It's to allow the car to travel at a greater range of speeds than is possible without one. There is a second benefit we can get from a gearbox and that's to use the best engine speed for the situation. Engines are more efficient at low revs and more powerful higher up the rev range. So we can use a gearbox to trade power for efficiency as we use it. In a manual car we use the clutch to do the disconnect for when we're stationary. In an automatic we use a torque converter to break the direct connection, allowing the engine to turn even when the wheels are stationary. The disconnect between the wheels and the engine is the first thing that I dislike in an automatic. I don't like the fact that the car coasts when I lift off the accelerator. I don't feel in as much control as when the car gives me engine braking, which is what we get in a manual. Now to be fair, automatics have changed a lot in the last 30 years. They now use a clutch to lock the torque converter in a lot of the gears, so the driving experience is much more consistent than it used to be, but it's still not quite perfect. Better still is the dual clutch transmission, although this isn't an automatic, this is a semi-automatic. This is a manual gearbox that is operated automatically on your behalf, and the driving experience of those is much more similar to driving a manual, in terms of getting engine braking and that feeling of being in control. So I've had a car with dual clutch transmission, and I quite like that, although they did replicate auto creep um, when you're uh, at stationary speeds and I, I didn't like that very much. In my video I chose to simplify and mention only one reason for autos being an imperfect trade-off and that is cost. Let's explore that aspect to see if that is still a valid concern. What I've done is headed to Autotrader, the well-known used car listing site here in the UK to see whether the cost between manual and automatics was still a factor for used cars. I decided to look for something similar in size to the Renault Zoe that I have, something I might choose to buy myself. In this comparison I'm just going to use uh, GBP, uh, UK sterling in comparisons, um, but the figures for US dollars and Europe would be roughly the same except our 
uh, UK market is a bit different in terms of pricing at the moment. So I've not tried to do comparisons. Anyway, what I came up with when I was looking was the Vauxhall Corsa. That seemed like a reasonable option. I had to choose the 1.2 litre turbo petrol as that seemed to be the only petrol variant available with both manual and automatic versions. And I wouldn't have a diesel these days because of the particulate permission, uh, emissions and all those kind of problems. So here is a 70 plate manual with just over 20,000 miles on the clock from a dealer for just under 12,000 pounds. In comparison, here's a 70 plate automatic with the same sort of mileage. This was 13,600 pounds. So buying an automatic is still more expensive, even on the used market, just as I thought. Although it's not a huge amount, the difference is 1,600 pounds in this case, 1,600 pounds. However, the purchase cost isn't the only premium you pay for owning an automatic. You may have mentioned in the video, you may remember in that, in that video I mentioned uh, the word inefficient as the other reason. Efficiency equates to cost in terms of running costs and fueling costs. Automatics are less efficient. Let's have a look at the impact of that on what it costs to run. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find real world efficiency figures for the Corsa, so I've had to use WLTP figures to compare these costs. That's not ideal, but it will give us an idea of the difference. The WLTP combined cycle figures for this engine are 52.3 miles per gallon for the manual and 48.7 miles per gallon for the automatic. That's a difference of 3.6 miles per gallon, about a 6.8% reduction from manual to automatic. What does that mean in terms of running costs? Well, I googled the average lifespan of a car and that is now considered to be about 200,000 miles these days. That allows us to calculate the fueling costs for the two based on today's average fuel price. The average fuel price, which I looked at this morning, is £1.44 a litre here in the UK. So to run these cars for 180,000 miles, that's the 200,000 mile lifespan, less the 20,000 miles they've already done, the costs come out as follows. The automatic will cost £24,196 to fuel for the rest of its life whereas the manual will cost £22,530. So that's another £1,600 premium for an automatic over a manual. And if we add those figures together, the running cost and the purchase price, that's a total of more than £3,200 premium over its life. Now, of course, I've used today's prices for fueling for the entire life of the car, which is not realistic. In practice, fuel will get more expensive, and so the difference between them will increase over, the, over time. However, inflation means that the value of the monetary amounts um, will get less. So it's not bad for a simple comparison to just use today's fueling prices. But wait a minute, I thought, the Corsa comes with an electric drivetrain as well. So then why don't we have a look at the costs of owning that while we're here? Well, here's a 71 plate Corsa E with 21,900 miles on the clock in a fetching orange colour for £12,479. Now, this is not a colour I would have, I have to say. It's a little bit bright, but uh, there was a blue one as well. It just had more miles on, so it was a slightly less good comparison. So that price, £12,479, is £1,100 cheaper than the automatic was. And that's for a car that's actually a little bit newer as well. Not only that, but the running costs of the electric are going to be a lot less as well. According to EV database, using their real world figure, the Corsa does an average of just under 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour in electric form. And I had to choose a price of electricity to do the calculations and I've gone with 20 pence per kilowatt hour. Now that's a little bit more than I am paying. I pay 16.4 pence per kilowatt hour based upon a mix of charging at home and charging uh, public charging when I'm away from home. 
16.4 pence, but I decided that you might do a little bit more public charging. Uh, and so I've gone with 20 pence per kilowatt hour, which is a slightly rounder figure anyway. And uh, for that, the fueling costs would be just under 12,600 pounds. That's almost half of the fueling costs for the automatic petrol. If we were to add up the figures for both uh, fueling and purchase, the difference over the life of the car is over 12,700 pounds in favor of the electric. So yes, I could buy an automatic, but on balance, the EV looks like a better move to me. In summary, yes, you can buy an automatic to fix a couple of the small imperfections I mentioned in the video that got those comments. But to think that that makes an ICE car comparable to an EV is rather missing the bigger picture. That video was about 10 little niceties, little DVD bonus extras, if you will, that you'll benefit from when you switch to an EV. And those were not the reasons for switching. Whilst EVs are not perfect, they are, there are a lot of benefits to switching that you need to take into account. You might not want to hear the benefits of owning an EV, but the ownership story is pretty compelling if you consider the argument as a whole. Well, that's it for another one. Thanks again for joining me. Your questions and comments are most welcome in the section below as ever. If you've liked the video, it helps me if you click the thumbs up button. That tells YouTube that you've enjoyed the video and it may promote it to others who will also enjoy it. And of course, click subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks.